Your home for Hannity each afternoon at 3 p.m. Talk 96.3 and 103.7. Welcome in to News and Views with Tom Lamprecht. The stories you've heard and the ones you need to hear. You ready to go to work? Oh, my God. I'm so ready to go to work. Kamala, she will be a great vice president. There will be a great team. She was extraordinarily nasty to Joe Biden. Higher taxes, open borders, socialized medicine. It's no surprise that he chose Senator Harris to be his running back. I'm prepared to fight. What I say is this. Your life, your values, your voice. This is News and Views with Tom Lamprecht on Talk 96.3 and 103.7. All right, welcome in. It is News and Views. Another day. Uh, got a good lineup for you, including uh, Carol Swain. We had her on about a month ago. She was the um, black professor from Vanderbilt who's retired. She told us last time she was on with us. It can't to be such a pain in the you know what, to be a black conservative woman at a liberal university, she finally said, forget it. And she, uh, she quit, but she's going to join us to uh, talk about, uh, Kamala Harris and what, um, she thinks of that pick by Joe Biden. As we speak, Joe Biden is up in Wilmington, Delaware, and he is, uh, getting ready to introduce Kamala Harris. They were supposed to come on, I think it was at two thirty, and he just came on a couple of minutes ago. So he is alive and well. I think a lot of people were speculating was something wrong with Joe. Uh, The answer to that question is yes, but uh, he still managed to make it to the podium. Uh, You know, it's interesting. Back in April of 2019, the headlines on the Hill was Kamala Harris. I believe Joe Biden accusers. Remember those women that came out in the midst of the um, primary when Kamala Harris was still in the primary? She said she believed the accusers. And August 11th, 2020, Joe Biden picks Harris for his VP. Will the mainstream media ask that question? Do you still believe the accusers? Somehow I doubt it. WITN and other media outlets are reporting the North Carolina High School Athletic Association will not play high school football this fall and all other sports will see shortened schedules. Commissioner Q. Tucker announced in a video statement this afternoon these changes were put forth after a vote by the North Carolina High School Athletic Association Board of Directors Tuesday night. High school football will now begin in early February and run through at least early April. No sports will be allowed to hold official tryouts or practices until at least November the 4th. All sports seasons will be shortened. Football will play seven games, and most others will play about 14 games. Starting November, cross-country and volleyball will be the first sports to be played. Those seasons will run through early January. Swimming will start in late November and run through the end of January. The basketball season has been pushed back until December and run through mid-February. I mean, they say all this based on the idea, I guess, that uh, the coronavirus scare, well, we know it's going to end on November the 4th. So, yeah, this, this is all good. I mean, isn't that curious? No, no, stop, stop, think about this. Okay, I, I just put this together. The election is November the 3rd. The election is November the 3rd. And in this article, it says no sports will be allowed to hold official tryouts or practices until November the 4th. <laughs> Coincidence? I don't know. So there you go. I mean, we were saying all along, it'll all be gone the day after the election. Well, guess what? The day after the election is when you can have tryouts for sports. Unbelievable. Boys and uh, boys soccer and girls and boys lacrosse will begin in January and in mid-March. I think that's the normal season for us. It. It's a spring sport. Uh, golf, boys tennis, girls soccer, softball will be played in March and April. Baseball, girls tennis, track and field and wrestling will run from mid-April through mid-June. No decisions have been made yet about state playoffs. However, the North Carolina High School Association says they do plan on hosting postseason play. And again, the day after the election, go ahead and get your sports equipment out and uh, all will be fine. By the way, um, we mentioned yesterday the fact that um, the Big Ten and the Pac-10 announced they were postponing their season until the spring. Again, I don't know how you can pull that off. Um, however, this afternoon, university administrators of the schools in the big 10, and I'm sorry, the big 12 conference are not yet willing to cancel their 2020 fall football season. They've agreed to push forward with a September start. So we will see if that is the case. Will, um, East Carolina end up playing? 
Uh, speaking of East Carolina, a former ECU pirate who went on to play for the NFL is now headed for a federal prison. Richard Alston, who was sentenced in, on Wednesday to 14 years on federal dr- drug and money laundering charges, the 39-year-old Raleigh man played for the Pirates from 99 through 2002 as a quarterback and then a wide receiver. He played for the Browns as well as several Canadian football teams. The feds say Austin took part in a multi-year and cross-country conspiracy to traffic in large amount of marijuana and distribute that high rate of marijuana to people in Raleigh. During a 2017 search, agents found over 40 pounds of pot and more than $370,000 in cash at one apartment. Federal agents then intercepted a shipment headed to Austin and seized 440 pounds of pot, $67,814 in cash. The feds uh, claim Austin had laundered over $2.7 million through a business bank account over several years and conspired to distribute more than 2,200 pounds of marijuana. Austin was sentenced in Wilmington. Carolina Journal is reporting more than 4 million North Carolinians are missing from the 2020 census. Major media reports have emphasized a low census count could put billions in federal dollars at risk, but also could keep North Carolina from gaining a congressional seat. The census count done every 10 years helps determine how federal money is allocated to communities. It also determines representation in Congress. North Carolina's population has grown by nearly 1 million people over the past decade, but if census takers don't count them, the people parceling out congressional districts won't know that they are here. Each state gets at least one of the 435 seats in the U.S. House, and the other 385 are divided mainly by population. Fast-growing states can pluck congressional seats from states losing people. North Carolina should get a 14th district. We have about 10.6 million people, roughly 100,000 fewer than Georgia, which has 14 congressional seats. But Michigan, population 10 million, is expected to lose one of its 14 congressional seats. If North Carolina's census count comes in at or below Michigan's, the 14th U.S. representative so many have anticipated could go to another state, perhaps Montana. Um, Carolina Demography, a UNC Chapel Hill center focusing on data collection, found North Carolina's census response ranked at 35th in the United States as of August 2nd. Only 59% of North Carolina households have reported, compared to 63% nationally. One factor helping North Carolina is its large military presence. Now, what's interesting is, uh, last census, military who were serving overseas were not allowed to be counted in the North Carolina census because they weren't here at the time. However, this year... Military personnel who are based out of North Carolina will be counted as a part of the North Carolina census. That rule was changed. And so uh, another reason why we very well might get a 14th congressional district in North Carolina. We'll see. So I mentioned to you the um, North Carolina Athletic Association, High School Athletic Association, basically saying we're going to put our uh, fall schedule on hold until the day after the election. The American Thinker has an interesting article out today slamming Dr. Anthony Fauci. I mean, talking about the fact, okay, he's busy with uh, his photo shoots and trying to throw baseball, (laughs) first pitches at baseball games. Didn't do too good of a job on that. But um, this story really centers around hydroxychloroquine, HCQ. And there is a, a, a new study out that says, look, th- this drug, which Donald Trump has said, look, it's been around for 70 years and it is safe. It's been used to tr- treat arthritis. It's um, a malaria disease, a uh, malaria drug. And what's interesting about this, you know, Fauci came out and said, well, you know, well, you know, you can't really say anything because we haven't had a real good study on that. Fauci um, has, has downplayed this from the get-go, as um, the other Dr. Um, Burks has, has done as well, not as dogmatic as Fauci has, perhaps. Uh, Fauci said to MSNBC earlier this year, you look at the scientific data and the evidence and the scientific evidence on trials that are valid, that were randomized and controlled in a proper way, all of those trials show consistently that hydroxychloroquine is not effective in the treatment of the coronavirus disease or COVID-19. 
Well, there's a new study out, and uh, what's interesting about this, if, um, let's see, it was uh, Dr. Bruce Dale, who is uh, from Michigan State University, and how and Mark Howard, doctor, um, is also of the, um, the same uh, Michigan State University. They say the average death rate in five co- uh, countries, India, Costa Rica, Australia, South Korea, and Brazil, that have made early use of hydroxychloroquine is about six people per million inhabitants. In contrast... The death rate in the United States is 167 people per million inhabitants, almost 30 times as many deaths as these other countries. So what's interesting about this is some of your less, uh, well, in some cases, third world countries that are taking hydroxychloroquine have got a lower death rate than the death rate of the United States. Even in developing com- countries like Ukraine, Greece, Cuba, Morocco, Indonesia, Algeria, fared better than the United States. The American Association of Physicians and Surgeons conclude that the safety of hydroxychloroquine is well documented when the safe use of this drug is projected against uh, its apparent effect of decreasing the progression of, of the early cases To ventilator use, it is difficult to understand the reluctance of the authorities in charge of the U.S. pandemic management to recommend its use in the early COVID-19 cases. And again, most of these studies, you know, they came out and they said, well, it's not working in the VA hospitals. Yeah, it's not working there. Well, because those people are on death's door by the time they get it. And they say, oh, look, it didn't work. But uh, this is a uh, rather damning article to Dr. Fauci. Dr. Harvey Reich, a professor at Yale University of Public Health, said Tuesday he thinks hydroxychloroquine could save 75,000 to 100,000 lives if this drug is used widely to treat the disease early on. Uh, They go on to say, and and also researchers at the Henry Ford Health System in southeast Michigan have found that the early administration of hydroxychloroquine makes hospitalized parents substantially less likely to die. So... There you have it, uh, which is really interesting because um, Biden, I just listened to the opening comments of Joe Biden, and what did he say? He was all over Donald Trump because he says 150,000 people have died from the COVID-19, and yet whose fault is it? It's Donald Trump. He hasn't done enough. What did Donald Trump say early on? Let's use hydroxychloroquine, and everybody poo-pooed him. Unbelievable. Hey, we got to take our early time out. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Carol Swain. We're going to be talking about the uh, Kamala Harris pick for Joe Biden's VP. See what she thinks. Stay with us. We'll be right back. How much does the word reliable mean? Sure, all businesses describe themselves as reliable, and we certainly wouldn't expect any business to be unreliable, but when you take a word like reliable and make it your way of life, the entire core of your business, it tends to mean a little more, and it's something you have to show people, not tell them. At Delcor, we show it by being there the same day you call. We show it by simply doing outstanding work with exceptional products, a family-oriented work ethic, and genuine caring for all of our neighbors throughout Eastern NC, because in a time of need, we know the first and the only thing you need is someone you can count on. That's why we only use equipment you can count on too, like a train comfort system. It's hard to stop a train. Delcor can have a new train comfort system installed in no time, or we can provide an AC tune-up to make sure your system is performing well. So will your system keep you cool all summer? Find out. Call us. We're Delcor, the service professionals. Reliable for over four decades. Visit DelcorInc.com today. Delcor, independent train comfort specialist dealer. Globe Pharmacy is your local independent pharmacy in Uptown Greenville. Pharmacist Paige Hamilton opened Globe Pharmacy on the corner of 4th and Evans Street last year. Why choose Globe Pharmacy? Globe Pharmacy offers free delivery up to 10 miles and a personalized review of all your prescriptions and recommendations for generic alternatives to expensive meds. Businesses can set up a prescription delivery program and vaccine clinics for their employees with Globe Pharmacy. Visit GlobeGreenville.com and find Globe Pharmacy on Facebook. 
It's not just a home or a car. It's your Ultra HD flat screen you bought just in time for football season. And that third car, so your team can drive to practice. While other insurance companies just see them as a bundle or combo, State Farm agent Merle Green and his team sees your home and car as things you work really hard for. Merle understands what they mean to you and is here to help you give them the protection they deserve. Talk with State Farm agent Merle Green and his licensed staff in Williamston for your home and auto insurance today. The greatest of all time. Krispy Kreme has brought back three of the all-time greatest fan favorite Reese's Donuts. That's right, Reese's Donuts are back at Krispy Kreme. There's the Reese's Classic Donut, filled with Reese's Peanut Butter Cream, dipped in Hershey's Chocolate Icing, topped with mini peanut butter chips, and a drizzle of Reese's Chocolate and Peanut Butter. Then there's the Reese's Original Filled Chocolate Lover's Donut, filled with Reese's Peanut Butter Cream and dipped in delicious Hershey's Chocolate Icing. And finally, the Reese's Outrageous Donut that's dipped in Hershey's Chocolate Icing, topped with mini Reese's Pieces, and a drizzle of salted caramel and Reese's Peanut Butter. And Krispy Kreme is asking you to help choose which of these three is truly the greatest. And that donut will stay as a permanent menu item. Try all three Reese's Donuts at Krispy Kreme today. Krispy Kreme, Greenville, Goldsboro, and Rocky Mount. This is now Kamala Harris as Vice President. I'm prepared to fight. So I was a little surprised that he picked her. This is tomorrow. Assistance for those who are unemployed. Classes this fall. This is your world. The latest on all this and more. Because this matters. This is Tom Lamprecht with more news and views on Talk 96.3 and 103.7. All right, welcome back. It is 22 minutes after the hour. Carol Swain is a black American conservative analyst and former professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University. She's authored several books. She's also a member of the Black Voices for Trump Advisory Board. She was with us probably about a month or so ago. She is back with us today to talk about Kamala Harris. Professor Swain, welcome back in. Good to have you with us. It's my pleasure. By the way, I want to tell you, the last time we had you on the air, I got more comments on that interview with you. Uh, it was. It, we do appreciate your time, and it was a very, very positive. A uh, lot of positive feedback on that. L- give me your initial reaction. Um, were you surprised at the pick, and w- do you think it's going to help Joe Biden's ticket? Well, I'm a supporter of Donald Trump, and so I could not be more thrilled by the pick. And no, I don't think it's going to help the uh, Joe Biden's ticket because. He will not be able to generate enthusiasm among black voters. He promised them an African-American woman. And I believe that when you look at Kamala Harris's background and the fact that she is a woman of color, but she's not African-American, I don't think that she will be able to generate the kind of support that he would hope for. Black people are not that dumb. (laughs) <laughs> well, apparently they think so. But you're right. You know, when she ran for the U.S. Senate and she won, she, she actually acknowledged in an interview with an Indian television news crew that she was she considered herself Indian American. And now that she's running for the vice presidency, she's saying, well, I was born black and I will die black and I'm black. I mean, you can be anything you want to be in the Democratic Party. It's all about (laughs) how you identify. And so for this interview, I can be a white male. There you go. There you go. Well, I mean, it's true. I mean, Elizabeth Warren's an American Indian, right? And it, and that maybe that's why they're into transgenderism because you know if if you identify as a male and you're a woman or vice versa, you know you can be what you want to be. And when you say it is not going to um, excite black Americans. Uh, you and I talked about the last time and uh, we had Ken Blackwell on a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the African American vote. It was pretty obvious that Joe Biden felt like he was cornered and had to pick I mean he, he uh, an unfort- well, I don't know if it was unfortunate. It was fortunate for for Republicans and for the Trump campaign. I don't know if it was fortunate for Joe Biden, but he sort of backed himself in a, in a corner or was pressured to pick a a woman of color as they put as they put it right uh, and, and you know what bothers me like affirmative action has been around since the 1970s and it was supposed to address the 
lingering effects of past and present discrimination. And with affirmative action, you created opportunities for minorities, opportunities for them to compete on an equal basis. You had to have qualifications. It seems to me that the Democrats are going backwards. Everything that they're doing now uh, is all about race, but it's about just advancing people because of the color of their skin and also exempting young people from the uh, competition. They are, they are assuming in a very racist fashion that blacks can't meet standards that some of us had to meet to get our degrees and to uh, progress in life. All we wanted was equal opportunity. And right now with Kamala Harris and Joe Biden's promise that he was going to have a person of color, and, and he's also said a black woman, I think that uh, this is not the time in American history that we should be engaging in that. Like, we've been through that. We've had affirmative action. And the problem with Kamala Harris is that we are essentially picking the next president of the United States yeah. because it's clear that Joe Biden cannot even debate President Trump. He does not want to come out of his basement, and when he does come out, he makes numerous gaffes. He's still making racist statements. Having Kamala Harris on the ticket will not erase the fact that the person at the head of the ticket is someone who's not ready to lead, is not able to because of his health and his age. And when I'm his age, if I'm in the condition that he's in, I hope someone will quietly lead me away from a microphone or an interview or anything yeah. else that would cause me to constantly embarrass myself. We're talking to Carol Swain. She is a member of the Black Voices for the Trump Advisory Board. You know, when you just mentioned what you did, it, it uh, what caught my eye earlier today was a quote from Candace Owens, another black conservative. She said, white liberals hate black conservatives because we don't see ourselves as oppressed, fundamentally because we view ourselves as their equals. That's the issue. When um, last night there was up in Chicago a um, an anti Black Lives Matter in uh, a, a protest, so this is an anti Black Lives Matter protest in Inglewood, which is a, a part of of Chicago, and uh, the people up there were saying, "Go away to the Black Lives Matter protest. You you come in here, you you raise Cain, you cause riots, you make us look bad." You, you hurt our relationship with the police departments. Has the anarchist, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, the, the hyper-progressives, have they taken all this anti-George Floyd stuff so far that they're actually hurting their own cause? Well, I mean, the Antifa and Black Lives Matter, they are Marxist groups. They want to overthrow right. the United States. So for them, it may be working out just fine. But for average Americans, black and white, who have to live in the chaos they create, it's gone too far. And I'm glad that there are members of the black community who are standing up to these groups that have come to create chaos. I wish some of the Democratic Party leaders would stand up and condemn it because the violence is getting out of hand. And there are some people who seem to be trying to spark a race war between whites and blacks. I read this morning about a young white child who was riding his bike and a black man pulled the kid off the bike and executed him. Uh, Carol, that was right here. That was right here. That was 20 miles from where we are sitting right now in Wilson, North Carolina. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, to, to me, the, the anger and the frustration and the news playing up all this violence and trying to pretend that it's justified they are the ones that's responsible for taking deranged individuals and pushing them to the point that they're committing those acts of violence. And I don't know if that would get the media coverage it would get if it was a black child and a white man, but we need to stop the racial double standards and we need to confront the violence that's taking place. Otherwise, we will have a race war. And there are people who want a race war you may not know, in 2002, I published a book, The New White Nationalism in America. It's challenged integration. And there are clearly people on both sides that would want 
to have these conflicts. You're right about one thing. If if the the situation in Wilson, North Carolina, if that was reversed and it was a little black child and a white individual did that to a black child, there would be a whole new set of riots. Well, I mean, it would be all over the news nonstop. And to me, uh, we have racism in this country, but it's a racism that is a double standard that right now it is working against white Americans. And I think that the standard we should use, we should apply to everyone. And if it's wrong to shame little black kids, then it's wrong to shame little white kids. And if it's wrong to kill people because of the color of their skin, that certainly includes white people, too. And this is just, this is, you know, not rocket science. It has to do with values and principles that most Americans would agree with. Our leaders on both sides are failing us. The Republicans, as well as the Democrats, need to speak out against these acts of violence. We're getting far away from Kamala Harris. <laughs> well, but it, but it's all it, it, we are, but we're not because this is this is what they're going to be campaigning on, and the fact that they're not addressing these issues is it's it's rather stark. Well, getting back to Kamala, she has flip flopped on another a number of issues uh, on the marijuana issue, uh, on Medicare for all. She's flip flopped on immigration. Uh, she's flip flopped on the death penalty especially when it comes to her time as a um, attorney general in California, San Francisco and California, there are a lot of liberals that look at Kamala Harris and say, wait, wait, you were on the wrong side of these issues. And now, now you're singing a different tune. Uh, will, will that resonate with a black voter? Well, the fact that so many people see her as fake and phony and uh, one person called her a shape, shifter she's a chameleon and i think that will not play with most voters and so i think that they will hold her accountable and if you look at her early career i mean she was a hard liner when it came to mass incarceration of blacks right and she um and, and and if you look at the switches that she has made you know now she supports bernie sanders uh health care system She's behind AOC's Green New Deal. She had banned fracking. She wants to decriminalize, decriminalize illegal border crossings. And, um, and she wants the illegal aliens to get the same kinds of health care and benefits as Americans who are here legally that pay taxes who were born here. I think that's going to be problematic for average Americans. She is a fake. She is a phony. She's not even an African-American. She's a person of color you know, from India with a Jamaican father. And what the Democrats are trying to do, they told us that Barack Obama was America's first black president. But again, we had a person who was not a descendant of slaves, who was not uh, an African-American in the traditional sense, and uh, he had no connection to the legacy of slavery. And I think that they're trying to do the same thing with Kamala. Her background is not the background of people that would like to see an African-American descendant of slaves achieve uh, great success in America at the highest level. You're a member of the Black Voices for Donald Trump Advisory Board, so you have the ear of the president. How would you advise him as he, uh, obviously there's going to be a lot of rhetoric coming out from the president through Twitter, through campaign stops and those kind of things. What advice would you give to the president in his campaign as he addresses the Kamala Harris issue? I wouldn't give it too much attention. I think the president needs to focus on outlining to the public all the great things that he's going to do during his second term because we know that he had, you know, a great economy. We know what the Democrats have done to him over the past almost four years. And, uh, and we know that Kamala Harris is not... Uh, ready to lead this country and that Joe Biden is not fit to stand uh, for, for the presidency. I think other people can carry that message and what Donald Trump should focus on, and he didn't ask me, uh, I think is just outlining his vision for the next four years. I think we will all be excited about what he can do. And hopefully during the second term, they will leave him alone and that he will be allowed 
greater latitude to implement his agenda. Star Parker had a great piece uh, that was published earlier this week, and basically she was just addressing the collapse of the traditional American family, which is is happening, and it, 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 whether you're black or white, the traditional American family is collapsing. When we look at when we look at Antifa and we look at Black Lives Matter and we look at Marxism, you know, they st they state in their own information, black and white, that they that they are against the nuclear family. Uh, there's stories out this week that Kamala Harris was encouraging people to promote, uh, or she promoted, I should say, the bail fund that several uh, Biden staffers donated to which were um, to the Minnesota Freedom Fund that posted bail for a lot of these rioters in Minneapolis. Um, Donald Trump came out on Monday and made comments about Joe Biden's face, saying the presumptive Democratic nominee can't agree with Bernie Sanders on a range of issues and still be a man of deep religion. Now, we know in the black family there is this, this sense of faith and their, their Christian faith and religion is, is a high priority. Um, and and that, that's been there for a long time, and yet we also see that there are a lot of uh, blacks that still have a tendency to pull the lever for the, you know, uh, you know that's next to the D, and even though that uh, Planned Parenthood is a, is a racist organization, it was founded by, you know, someone who's promoting eugenics, it, 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 is there... Is there a, a notice by the black voter that, wait a minute, what I, what I say I believe and what the Democratic Party is espousing doesn't line up? And more black Americans are becoming, quote, woke on the issues, and they are realizing that the Democratic Party is not their friend. And so I believe that President Trump will pick up anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of the black vote, maybe even more, because black people are getting very fatigued with the uh, Democratic Party and their strategies and the things they focus on. And I believe that it will be seen uh, in, at, the, at the polls. I don't think that blacks will turn out in high numbers with mu much enthusiasm for, for the Biden-Harris ticket. So that's one problem. Many of them may stay home, but a lot of them are going to vote for Donald Trump, and I believe that they will go to the Republican Party. The Republican Party has to be ready to receive them. And I think that there's more outreach now from Republicans than there has ever been before in a listening ear. Now, at the, the beginning of this interview today, you sounded like you know what I'm. I'm happy that he picked Kamala Harris because it's it's that's a good thing for Donald Trump. Was there anybody that uh, you were thinking? I hope Joe Biden doesn't pick this person because I think that would be a harder person to uh, compete with. I think if he had picked Elizabeth Warren, even though she's a liar and she's a fake, you know, Native American, I think she had a large constituency. She's young, uh, and I believe that no, she's not young, but she's young-ish compared to Joe Biden, and she seems <laughs> like she could lead. <laughs> All of us are young compared to Joe Biden. I got news for you, Carol. <laughs> Absolutely. I know, but uh, I think Elizabeth Warren uh, or some of the other uh, uh, white women uh, would have been a harder pick. It would it would have been more difficult uh, for. I'm not going to say that because I think the president's going to win by a landslide. I think Kamala Harris makes it much easier for Donald Trump than if Elizabeth Warren or some of the others had been picked. You know, we were talking yesterday because they, he announced this right as we went on the air yesterday. And, uh, you know, we put together a couple of quick uh, audio clips and stuff. But one of the audio clips we played yesterday was the audio clip of Kamala Harris just going after Joe Biden in the debates last year, d doing everything but coming, coming out and calling him a racist on his stance on school busing and how he aligned himself with some people. Of course, the Robert Byrd, the Grand Wizard, and those kind of things. D can Do you think, as a, as a politico, do you think that they can undo what was said in those debates last year? Well, whether we like it or not, everything we say 
uh, in this age is there forever. And yeah. so I don't think you can ever undo what you have stated. You know, she may try to explain it if she's asked to. But the bottom line is she was the worst possible pick, I believe. No, not really. The lady from Georgia, uh, she probably would have been worse. Oh, Stacey Abrams? I, Stacey Abrams. Yeah. Yeah, I, can't, I, I was shocked that they were even considering her. <laughs> that just was beyond the pale. Well, T- Tulsi Gabbard would have been great because, you know, she's energetic. She's fast on her feet. She's attractive. She would have made a great pick. Well, and she, yeah, she probably would have uh, pulled a few independents over towards his side. I agree with you. That would have been a good pick. Yeah. Carol Swain, thank you for your insights. It's always great to have you on. We hope to talk to you between now and November the 4th, or November the 3rd, I guess, is Election Day. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. You Bye. bet. Thank you. I've got to take another time out. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, Bertie County, we love living in eastern North Carolina, but it gets hot this time of year. 85% humidity? Bring it. 95 degree temperatures? Bring it on. That's because no matter how extreme the season gets, you can stay cool and comfortable with a Champion Premium Residential System. Call Bertie Electric Heating and Air Conditioning, your local Champion dealer, at 252-482-1702 to get a free estimate and learn how you can significantly reduce your energy costs this summer. Here's the best part of working with Bertie Electric Heating and Air Conditioning. You'll be calling an old friend. Bertie native Louis Farless is the owner and is happy to be able to help his old friends and neighbors in and around the Bertie County area. Call Bertie Electric Heating and Air Conditioning at 252-482-1702. That's 482-1702. Your local champion dealer in Bertie County. All major credit cards accepted. And ask about the 0% financing options at Bertie Electric Heating and Air Conditioning. So call 252-482-1702. And bring on the heat. With rates being historically low, now is the best time to buy or refinance your home. This is Talbot Green with Angel Oak Home Loans. Now is the time to take advantage of the opportunity to buy more home or refinance your current mortgage. The combination of our local team's experience and Angel Oak's wide offerings of products from standard conventional, government, and portfolio loans has something for most financial situations. For more information, call Talbot Green, Joanne Weir, or Wanda Hager at 751-2060. NMLS 1719250 and 685842. Equal housing lender. Vidant Health was selected by the state of North Carolina to help respond to the COVID-19 crisis in communities that are hardest hit by the virus. In August, Vidant is partnering with local faith-based organizations to offer testing opportunities in several eastern North Carolina counties, including Hertford County, Chowan, Duplin, Pitt, and Beaufort County. Appointments are not required for this testing. Please visit vitanhealth.com forward slash safe community for details or call us at 252-847-8000. Wild birds unlimited, don't you feel them around you? The song is everywhere. Even though it's still warm outside, it's August and fall is just around the corner. Wild Birds Unlimited in Greenville has just received their colorful fall flags and garden flags, mailbox covers, and mat mates for your home. Also, Wild Birds Unlimited wants you to remember that birds need water to bathe and drink. A source of water is important in providing a backyard habitat for your birds. From decorative stone and glass bird baths to water drippers and misters, Wild Birds Unlimited has what you need to fulfill your birds' water wishes. Add a splash of water to your backyard. Visit Wild Birds Unlimited today. Wild Birds Unlimited, located in Greenville across from Kickback Jacks in the Promenade Shopping Center. Open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6, Sunday 1 to 5. Wild Birds Unlimited, we bring people and nature together. Let your voice be heard this November. Register to vote now at vote.gov. I suppose it would be my civic duty. From Talk 96.3 and 1037, here's Tom Lamprecht with more news and views. Uh, welcome back. So we were talking to Carol Swain about uh, Kamala Harris, and she mentioned that originally, I mean, she's she's an Indian American. She's going around saying she's, she's a black American, and um, actually she's... Very light brown. I'd be honest with you, the first time I saw her, I said, okay, is she Caucasian or is she a mixed marriage or is she black? Or yeah, is she Hispanic? Um, 
listen to this though. This is this is cut two, Clark. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned in the comments to uh, to Carol, you know, if you're a Democrat and you're Elizabeth Warren, you can be an American Indian or you can be a Caucasian. And of course, they're all about transgenderism because if you're a guy, you can be a gal. If you're a gal, you can be a guy. It doesn't really matter. But listen, when she was running in just just four years ago in 2016, she was running for the U.S. Senate. Listen to how um, the news over in India addressed who she was. And also listen to this one piece of this. There's three different clips I put together, but this one clip, she's being interviewed by an Indian uh, newscaster at the uh, on the campaign trail. And, um, you know, he made reference to the fact that uh, she's an Indian American, and she basically says amen. California's Kamala Harris is the first Indian American U.S. Senator. Kamala Harris, California's Attorney General, has also made history becoming the first Indian American woman to be elected to the U.S. Senate. Harris has entered the Senate race after Barbara Boxer announced her intention to retire. The Democrat became an early frontrunner in a crowded primary field. She was born in Oakland, California, is the daughter of an Indian mother who emigrated from Chennai in 1960 and a Jamaican American father. You could become the first uh, Indian senator in U.S. history, which would be quite an accomplishment. Not good. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, as Carol said, she's somewhat of a fake. Everything's a, a big ha-ha laugh. But when it was convenient, she was an Indian American. Now it's more convenient to be a black American. I mean, the abuse, I mean, they're, they're all about affirmative action. And yet they abuse it for their own gain. I mentioned this uh, story to uh, Carol when I had her on the on the interview. Th this is really interesting. In Inglewood, which is a section of Chicago, a group of black residents yesterday got together, and they said, "Enough is enough." Black Lives Matter. You you come in here from your white neighborhoods. You come in here and raise all kinds of trouble for us. You ruin our relationship with the police department, and then you're gone, and we're left to clean up the mess. You have no interest in helping our community. Chicago Black Lives Matter organized a series of protests beginning Monday in support of 100 individuals arrested during Sunday night's shocking events claiming the looting is reparations and that the alleged criminals were simply protesting and taking what is rightfully theirs from, quote, corporations. On the second night of the Chicago Black Lives Matter protest, however, residents of the Southside neighborhood, where the initial triggering incident occurred, showed up at the Black Lives Matter rally to demand the protesters leave. Standing in the middle of 63rd Street, encircled by police reform protesters, Dwayne Kidd, a 42-year-old lifelong resident of Inglewood, yelled, None of these blankety blanks are going to be here tomorrow. That's why I've got a problem. If they would have gotten something incited with the police, who's going to deal with it tomorrow? The community, not them. They'll be somewhere sipping their sangria somewhere. I'm telling you like it is. Daryl Smith, a community activist and president of the Inglewood Political Task Force, was even sharp, uh, sharper and harsher. This is what he said um, the yesterday afternoon. I live in Inglewood, 51 years. Are you out here representing any organization? Uh, I represent my organization, the Inglewood Political Task Force. Also, I represent the, the community of Inglewood. Okay, so what are you guys out here for tonight? Well, first of all, let me start off by saying there's been a lot of misconceptions since the shooting of this 20-year-old boy. Um, a lot of people saying that the moving downtown sparked from Inglewood. We're not having that. It didn't spark from Inglewood. Those were opportunities. We're tired of Inglewood being a black eye for any and everything that happens. Now, today, there's a protest, which a protest was scheduled, where they're gonna come down here, rumors had it, they're gonna bust out the police windows. Um, no matter what they were gonna do, they weren't gonna come to Inglewood antagonizing our police. And then when they go back home to the north side in Indiana, our police are bitter and they're beating up our little black boys. So we're not gonna have that. 
we have a relationship with the commander and if anyone wants to come in here and talk to the police about the shooting or anything they have to go through us we have a we have a relationship are all the police good no they're not but all the police are not bad and if you have a relationship in your community with the police we don't need any outsiders coming and antagonizing so you're here someone taking issue with the protesters who are coming here this afternoon yeah, I had an issue because none of them were from Inglewood. So what is your issue? If your issue is with the police, take it to 35th and Michigan. Don't come in Inglewood. This is exactly what I was talking about yesterday, and, and Carol was talking about it today. The race baiters and the anarchists don't speak for anyone other than their own Marxist cause. And I think they've overplayed their hand big time to the point it's going to explode in their face. And as I mentioned to, to Carol... There's a story out today that Kamala Harris was encouraging people to support the Minnesota Freedom Front Fund, which has bailed out individuals, including Darnika Floyd, who was charged with second-degree murder, stabbing a friend to death, nice, nice friend, Christopher Boswell, who's faced with sexual assault and kidnapping, they put up 100000 for one and $350,000 for Boswell. The Minnesota Freedom Fund received about $35 million in the wake of George Floyd's death. And Harris, a former prosecutor who served as the Attorney General of California for six years, promoted the fund herself in a June 1st tweet telling her followers that the, followers that the group would be able to help protesters swept up in the clashes with police as unrest gripped Minneapolis. If you're able to chip in now, chip in to the uh, Minnesota Freedom Fund to help post bail for these protesting on the ground in Minnesota, she tweeted. Uh, Jalee Hastings was accused of shooting at police during the May riots, was bailed out by this group. Donovan Boone was charged with invading the home of his ex-girlfriend and choking her. He was bailed out on this, as were numerous others. Uh, and and what, what I'm saying is, these people on the left that are running for the presidency and the vice presidency are supporting Antifa and Black Lives Matter. And yet at the same time, while the mainstream media wants to make sure you don't know about it, they do know about it because it's happening in their own neighborhoods. We got to take a break. I'll be right back. My mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's seven years ago. Her dementia is worsening, and after dad passed, I moved her in with my husband and I. Mom's fought this beast for so long, and I can tell she's tired. Mom deserves better. Mom deserves home. Mom deserves the team at Pruitt Health Hospice. You see, I thought hospice was only for people in their dying days, but I was wrong. Pruitt Health Hospice brought mom back to her life. The partners at Pruitt Health Hospice work to treat the whole person, not just the signs and symptoms of an illness. That means they support their patients, yes, physically, but also emotionally, spiritually, and mentally. Pruitt Health Hospice provides nurses, social workers, chaplains, CNAs, volunteers, and physicians all from the comfort of our home. They worked together to provide forms of patient care that ultimately shared a common goal, to relieve my mother's suffering and improve her quality of life, however long that may be. Thank you, Pruitt Health Hospice, for all you do and for being committed to caring. I'm here with my good friend Scott Shook of the Shook Rouse Group of BB&T, Scott and Stringfellow. Scott, what are the main philosophies that you and Thomas follow to help your clients? Henry, we start by talking with our clients about their financial goals. Once we have an understanding of what they want to accomplish, we advise them on investing their assets in a manner they can be comfortable with through good times and bad. We firmly believe that asset allocation, diversification, and rebalancing are the only long-term strategy, not timing the market. Scott, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? That's easy, Henry. Just give us a call at 252-378-3299. BB&T Scott and Stringfellow is a division of BB&T Securities, LLC, member of FINRA SIPC. BB&T Securities is a wholly owned, non-bank subsidiary of Truist Financial Corporation. Securities and insurance products are annuity sold, offered, or recommended, are not a deposit, not FDIC insured, not guaranteed by a bank, not insured by any federal government agency, and may lose value. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Asset allocation cannot eliminate the risk of fluctuating prices and uncertain returns. Diversifying investments is not a against market loss. 
On the north shore of the Pungo River, just eight miles from the massive Pamlico Sound, lies the beautiful town of Bell Haven. This picturesque community has attractive historic buildings, shops, restaurants, and incredible open water views. Come to Bell Haven and find out why the boats stop here. O'Neill's Drugs offers the fastest and friendliest service in Bell Haven. Located on the corner of Main Street near 264 Bypass, their family's been taking care of families like yours since 1932. Visit them at O'Neill'sDrug.com. Market declines, unemployment, oil prices. Don't let headlines derail your long-term financial strategy. Edward Jones Financial Advisor Mike Goodwin can help. Stop by the office at 183 East Water Street in Bellhaven. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Member SIPC. Since 1960, Sawyer's Land Developing has served landowners and local utilities with clearing, grading, and heavy earth construction. When you partner with Sawyer's Land Developing, your project will be on time, high quality, and on budget. Call 943-2154 or online at sawyerslanddeveloping.com. Back to News and Views. Talk 96.3 and 103.7. A federal appeals court issued a landmark decision Friday for transgender students declaring unconstitutional a Florida school district policy requiring individuals to use the restroom that corresponds with their biological sex. It was the first ruling of its kind by a federal appeals court and involved a student, Drew Adams, who is a biological female but identifies as a male. So this Drew Adams gal is now allowed to use the guy's bathroom. Pardon my bluntness, but it'll be really interesting to see Drew use a urinal. I mean, I hope she brings a change of clothes with her because it's going to be a big mess. I mean, she wants to use the guy's bathroom, right, to go take a wee-wee? And she's going to get it all over herself if she tries to use the urine. I mean, biologically, it doesn't work. And yet you got these idiots. And this was the, the judge, Beverly Martin, who wrote for the majority in this, this uh, decision. Uh, who do you think she was appointed by? Can you say Barack Obama? Bingo, you win the prize. Hey, we got to run our thanks to uh, Carol Swain. And uh, we'll do it again tomorrow, play a little political trivia. We'll see you then. Bye-bye, everybody.